you're able to spend in your word. We thank you for everything you've done through us, through, for, through your son. I pray that as we study your word today that we'll be edified and we'll take the information that we learn, apply it to our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to Malachi chapter 3. Did you know I was going there? So what I want to do today is I want to look at tithing, and um, I want to, my, my topic is should we tithe, but um, when you look at the question of should we tithe, it's a question that when people ask, should we tithe is probably not the real question that they're asking, right? And when, when you look at Malachi, and I still haven't turned there because I started talking, and you look at chapter 3. And um, we'll start in verse 8. It says this. It says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouses, that there may be meat in mine house, and may prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So back to my original premise. When most people ask the question, should we tithe, what they're really asking is, how much do I have to give before God gets me? Isn't that usually what the question is? The next question is, how much should I give? And, and what it is, is it's a very simple issue that people use, as Rick said, as a club to beat people with and to say, you need to give this much or you need to give that much. And people get wrapped up in that to the point, you know, you may be here and have been in the message for a long time and say, you know, tithing's a simple issue. I dealt with it in week number two when I, when I found grace. But do you know it's the simple messages that when they get wrong cause the biggest problems, right? Is the gospel a simple message? Does it cause quite a problem if you get it wrong? Eternity in hell is a big problem. So when you look at the simple things, don't ever think they're simple because they have the greatest impact. If you think about the pond, they're the biggest rock that you throw into it. So they cause the biggest waves. And tithing is like that. And the reason tithing is like that is because tithing and the teaching of tithing is how many churches and religions exist today. Without it, they wouldn't. So it's it's an issue that is probably not going to go away anytime too soon because uh, when you start dealing with money and you start dealing with people's incomes... uh, things quickly get out of hand, right? So when you look at Malachi chapter 3, it it, it says this. It says, you know, you've robbed from me in tithes. And you've probably heard the sermon before where people have used that to tell you, look, you you better give your tithe or God's going to do this or this and this is going to happen. The problem with that is very basically, as I hope you all know, is when you look at Malachi chapter 3 verse 8, One, it's an Old Testament passage, correct? Two, it gives you some ideas in there about what's going on. It says, if you don't do this, what's going to happen? A curse. You're you're welcome to talk. I'm probably going to have some audience participation today. It's easier for you to help me teach. But um, when you also look at it, what's going to happen if they do do these things? So when you hear something like that, what should instantly come to your mind? The law, right? The the law should come to your mind. Exodus chapter 19, God has a covenant relationship with the nation Israel. They do this. You've heard this ten times this weekend already. They do this. I do this. And that's how the covenant relationship works. So what I want to do today is, one, if we're going to ask the question, should we tithe, where the real question is, is how much should I give before God gets me, we've we've got to do some basic things. So the first thing that we're going to do is look at tithing. After we're done looking at tithing, we're going to look at the foundation of tithing. After we're done looking at the foundation of tithing, we're going to go look at the foundation of giving in grace, and then we're going to look at what grace giving looks like. And by the time we get through all that, you should have sufficient understanding of how things should work. 
Now, before we do this, what I want to ask you is a simple question, and this, this gets right to the point of whenever you look at this period in your Bible. I often teach at my church, we'll talk about, I'll ask people, what's the gospel of the kingdom? And we're going to do this right now just because, we, we, we're, what's the gospel of the kingdom? And if you just look at the word, it's the good news about the kingdom, right? That's, that's it. Now, we know that Jesus Christ came, Why? According to Romans chapter 15. Yep, to confirm the promises made unto the Father. So when we look back here, an easy way to think about this is if I was going to build a nation, what would I need? I'd need money, that's right. (laughs) I wasn't going to get to that one last thing. I would need money, what else would I need? I no, no, no. That's right. Maybe I'm going to stop this, you help me teach things. But what happens... What happens is if you just think about things from a a basic standard perspective of, I'm going to build a nation today. I'm going to need a leader, right? Did God promise Israel a leader? Yes. Am I going to need, if I'm going to have a nation, I need a land, right? Did he give Israel a? Okay. If I'm going to have a land, I'm going to want to fill it with what? People. That's right. And if I'm going to fill it with people, I'm going to want those people to be able to be identified so I give them a specific identity, which is good, circumcision. Good, maybe I will let you keep teaching. So you give them circumcision. Now, if if I have these people and they have an identity and I have them in a land and I'm going to give them a leader, and originally was there going to be a king? Who was the king supposed to be? God himself, right? So... If I'm going to have these people, what do I need when I have people? Laws, right? (laughs) You've got to have laws. So God gives them the law. So when you think about the Old Testament, a lot of people get all wrapped up in all kinds of different things and thinking about it. But when you just boil it down to the basics, it makes sense, right? So when you look at this and you look at God promised these things, a nation, a land, a people with an identity, and they're going to have laws, and you look at the whole Old Testament, pretty much anything you run across in there, you can slide into one of those categories, and that should help you think about how you should think about the passages. Now, that being said, when you look at tithing, and you look at how tithing is taught today, and I'm going to make a little sub-point here that I want you to know. Isn't it interesting that when People go to the scriptures and they're going to pick out a way to fund whatever they want to fund. They go back to tithing. Because are there other giving programs in the scriptures? There are. If I go to Luke chapter 18, just go to Luke chapter 18 and let's look at this. Luke chapter 18. And in verse 22, it says, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. When was the last time you heard somebody get up and say, Look, we've got a giving program. You know why that giving program doesn't work in churches? Because I need the money, not the poor. Right? My church goes under if you sell everything and give it to the poor. But isn't that a huge thing? I mean, why why don't people gravitate towards that one? It's easy to tell, right? Another one you can think about is Acts chapter 4. And we don't have to turn there, but if you think about what happens in Acts chapter 4, what do people do? They sell everything that they have and have everything in common. You guys want to do that? Uh, you want to share everything? Why do, why do people not go to that one? And here's the reason why. is because there's not as much leverage in those passages as there is when you take Malachi chapter 3 and you put people under a curse and say, look, you've robbed me, right? So let's look at tithes for a minute. And let's just talk about tithes for a minute. And when you look at anything in the scriptures, you should do the who, what, where, when, and why, right? When you look at anything in life, you should do the who, what, when, where, or why, or you might get confused. 
It's as simple as if you go out to use the restroom today. You want to look at the who on the door, right? (laughs) And you, you, you need to understand those things. So when you look at tithes in the Old Testament, and if you go to the Old Testament and you look at tithes, go to Leviticus chapter 27. We're going to look at what they were, and we're going to do this fairly briefly because we could spend hours dissecting this and looking at it, but we've only got about 45 minutes to do so. But when you look at Leviticus chapter 27, in verse 30, it says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man at all will redeem aught his tithes, he shall add thereunto. And he goes into some things here. But when you look at what's going on here, he says, a tenth of of, of these things is the Lord. Now, when you get over into Numbers, go over to Numbers chapter 18. Does that sound right, about a tenth, right? That's 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 what the term tithe means. So when you get over to Numbers chapter 18 and and you look at verse 24, it says, But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, "Among Among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. So when you look at this tithe in the Scriptures, and we're going to see that there's more tithes. We're not going to get into all of them. We're going to look at some of the amounts here. When you look at this tithe, this tithe goes to fund who? The Levites. So if you think about our thinking just for a minute, we had a a, a nation that had a land and it has a leader and it has a people and they have an identity and they have a law. Whenever you have laws, what do you need? You need somebody to facilitate those laws, right? And that's what, that's what the Levites do. So they facilitate those laws, and they don't have inheritance. So what happens is Israel gives these tithes, and, 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 and they can take these tithes to support them in their endeavors in facilitating the law and what goes on in the temple. Does that, it just makes basic sense, right? So that's what, when you look at tithings, and and you say, okay, what kind of tithes are there? That's a tithe that goes to the Levites. Now, the Levites themselves, guess what they have to do? They have to tithe as well, and you'll see that later. But let's look at a second tithe here, and that's in in, in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Now, what I want you to understand about tithes is if you go out and you just say, I want to learn something about tithing, and you type tithing into Google and you start looking at things, you have no idea what's going to come up, okay? And I think you know that about most things. But there's, there's, there's all kinds of, every, every commentator that you go to has a different perspective on exactly how tithing worked, maybe what amount it was, and there's all different kinds of ways to calculate things. So we're going to go with a high and a low today, all right? I'm going to give you a low, I'm going to give you a high, and we're going to just use that. Because when you look at tithing, remember I told you we're going to look at tithing, but then we're going to look at the foundation of tithing? The most important part is the foundation of tithing, right? I heard an, an illustration one time. It was a good illustration. I can't remember where I heard it from, but they were talking about the issues of the day, and they had, a, they had a picture of a tree, and they had all the issues of the day represented leaves, and what people do is they try and they go, and, and they're going to fight this tree. Let's say it's a giant weed, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to fight it by cutting off a couple leaves here and there. How long is that going to work? Well, you're cutting one over here, another one comes up over there, right? So what you've got to do is you've kind of got to cut the tree down, right? And that's what, we're, that's, that's what I'm aiming to do here today. So as we look at the tithes, I want you to remember the question of should we tithe, tithe or not is how much should I give to, to before God gets me? So we need to look at the basis of it. You're in Deuteronomy chapter 14, right? So in Deuteronomy chapter 14, and you look at these tithes, it says, it says, verse 22, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord. And he goes through and he gives a listing down through here of, of a tithe that if you want to call it a tithe of feasts, where people bring a tenth and, and then they feast on it. 
Let me ask you something. If you've been paying attention so far to what we've looked at, we looked at a tithe of a Levite, and now we're seeing one about some feasts, right? How much money has been exchanged here? It's not a trick question. What was, what's been exchanged? It's been food, right? <laughs> All right, good. I just want to make sure everybody's paying attention. So then as you get to the end of Leviticus chapter 27, and you look at verse 28, And it says, and at the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and thou shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and shall and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless them in all the work of thine hand, which thou doest. So this is a tithe. How often does it happen? What did the passage say? (coughs) Every three years. Now, if you take the tithes that we've looked at so far and you see that there's one that goes to the Levites, and how much is a tithe? Okay. And then I see that there's one that goes to some feasts, right? And then I see every three years there's another one that goes to help people. You could call it, uh, some, some people will call it a poor tithe, or it's basically like a welfare to help those that need it. What does all that come out to, if you do the math real quick in your head? So about 23 and a third, maybe, right around in there. And there's other factors that go on throughout the Old Testament giving. But if you look at that and you say, okay, here's just a basic number we can arrive at. Now, you, 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 some people argue and say, that didn't happen, they didn't give that much, this one replaced that one, and this one replaced that one, and you'll get numbers anywhere from 10%, which is what gets taught today, up to 23, up to 30, and then you'll see some that'll say 19.3. If you want to get into that, go study it. I encourage you to do so. But for our needs today, we don't need to get that far. So, what I want you to see so far is that when you look at the tithing, I think with the basic, most simple math you do in your head, you can figure out that it's probably around 23 and a little bit and and some change, percent of change. When was the last time you heard somebody teach tithing and ask you for 23%? You don't. Why? Because a tithe is 10%. That's what they're going to teach, and that's what they're going to ask you for. So, what people do is, as, as we know, and as I hope you know, and, 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 and if you're new to this, what people have done is they've gone back to the Old Testament and they've said, this is exactly how you're going to give today, and they've taken Israel and they've made it the church. And they've taken the Levites and they've made them the, the pastors. <laughs> and, and, and they've taken the Israelites and made them the congregation and then they've taken the food and made it money. There's, there's some change. There's some change going on there. But let me give you a basic verse that's, that's, that's not in the Old Testament, but I think it is one of the most important verses when it comes to tithing, and that's in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 5. Because what it does is it, it, it gives you in no uncertain terms what tithing is, and it brings out another point of tithing. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 5 says, And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Now, we're not going to get into the context of Hebrews chapter 7, so just think about what that verse made for me, says for a second. Do you, do, you, do you remember how I told you whenever you look at the Bible, what do you want to ask? The who, what, when, where, and why? This verse really does that for you, doesn't it? So it answers that because it says this. It says, and verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, so we have a who there, right? Who received the office of the priest priesthood, have a commandment to do what? Take tithes of the people according to the law. Does it get much more simple than that? The Levites are commanded to take the tithes. If I come up to you, if I have have authority over you, did the Levites have some authority? 
Yes, because they facilitated the law, right? And I came over to you, and I, and I had some authority over you, and I said to you, hey, look, you owe me this because this is what the law says. Have you ever been in a situation like that in life where somebody in authority over you says, look, you owe me some money, and let me show you what the law says that? You ever have that? Did you buy anything today? <laughs> Did you buy anything yesterday? Do you pay income taxes? Isn't that what this sounds like? And if you think about it, it makes sense from the standpoint that we have a nation that has a land, that has a people, that have an identity, that have laws, that have people who facilitate those laws, and these laws that are being facilitated in this land needs what? It's got some income to support those people through cash, through, is it cash? No, through what? Food, right? We've seen that at all those. Now, so I think what you come, I think what you come to here is it says, have a commandment to take tithes of the people. This is Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5. According to the law, that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So if you take what, just what we've learned so far, what we've learned is if you evaluate the who, what, when, where, and why of tithing, it is 100% on every point taught wrong today, right? It's taught wrong from the who because the who is either the church or the congregation. It's taught wrong on the, the what because it's 10%, and in, in the Old Testament, is it 10%? No. It's taught wrong on the where if you get into the one of the feasts, it says you need to take your tithes to the place that the Lord has chosen. All right? So the where is wrong. The when is wrong. When you look at the tithes in the Old Testament, did they have a time frame attached to them? They do. We saw one that was every three years, right? And the other ones were annually. So the time frame is wrong. When we look at the why... Generally, tithes are taken from a church. And if you spiritualize you, yourself and make yourself a priest, I guess you could say that, okay, if I'm a priest, I, I can do these things. But honestly, the, most of the time the tithe is preached, it, it, it is for some income purposes, but for the most part, it's for the building program, right? It's for the latest and greatest technology. It's for the expansion of the parking lot. It's for the gym, does that sound like what you learned about in the Old Testament? Can't build those things out of food, can you? <laughs> and then the how is wrong as well. So who, what, when, where, why, and now we're going to add the how. How is the how wrong? Well, the how is wrong from the standpoint of how did the priests get the tax? They were commanded of the law to get the tithe, right? So, so they went out and they got it. And if they didn't get it, what happened? There was curses. We saw that in Malachi. And they technically robbed God. Is that the way it's done today? You're put under that leverage, but is that really the way it, it's done? No. It's still done in a voluntary manner. That's why there has to be so much leverage put on, onto you to get you to do it. It reminds me, it reminds me of Galatians chapter 4. Go to Galatians chapter 4, and I'm... I'm going to take a verse maybe somewhat out of context, but I think the question is still applicable to what we're looking at. And in Galatians chapter 4, it says, Tell me ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Folks that desire to be under tithing, or churches that desire to put their members under tithing, do they not hear what the law says? I don't, I don't think so. Now, what that brings us to is the most important part of that Hebrews chapter 7 verse 5 for our purposes and understanding tithing is the foundation of it and why did the Levites collect the tithes and who did they collect it from they collected it from Israel right but why did they do that you remember what the why was there and I'm not talking about why as far as where did it go but what was the why because it was commanded by the the law are you under the law today no, isn't that what the whole book of Galatians is about? And I know you've heard these verses this weekend. 
already, but look at Romans chapter 6. And look at verse 14. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but, are, but under what? Grace. We're not under the law, we're under grace. And go to, go, go to, go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. To what degree are you and I under the law today? We're not, right? It was our schoolmaster. It showed us our sin so that we could come to Christ understanding what His sacrifice was for. It was for my sin. So when you look at that, the tithe is just as much a part of the law as any other part of the law that you ignore, right? And I don't, want, I don't say ignore from a bad standpoint. We should study. We should look at these things because they help us give us understanding. So... Anybody make any sacrifices this weekend? No. Why not? Because we don't do that, right? We're not under the law. Well, the same thing goes for tithing. And what that gets us to is it gets us to this. Go to, go to, go to Romans chapter 7. The reason, I, the reason I bring out the law issue, because the law issue is the foundation of tithing. So you can study tithing and know everything in the world about tithing and determine from studying tithing that it's wrong. And people argue and argue and argue and argue over each and every point about how much or this or how much or that, and that's what you see. But the problem is, is if you don't get rid of this foundation of the law and show people that tithing was part of the law, which Hebrews did in no uncertain terms for us, and get rid of that tithing. Now that we, or we, get rid of, we get rid of the law and see that we're not under the law, but we're under grace, what happens when you take the foundation out from something? It falls. And it should fall in your mind when you think about these things because people still try and put you under this. You hear it all the time with tithing. So Romans chapter 7, verse 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye are also... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So there we're told... If, if the law is gone, the oldness of the letter is gone, how are we supposed to serve? That's fair. So, if the law is gone and the foundation of tithing is out of the way, and we know that is giving still for today? Yes, we should give. But what we've got to do is we have to establish a new foundation for giving. And I'm going to give you that. that. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Now, this, these may not be verses that come to your mind as a foundational verse for giving. But I assure you that when you look at these verses and you look at what they say, and then you look at every other verse on Pauline giving, that these verses are the foundation of giving today. So once you've got rid of the law, what's the opposite of law? Grace. And what does grace produce in our lives? Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, I'll give you the answer. What's it do? It it produces liberty. So when you look at Galatians chapter 5 and you look at verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So we're told that we're supposed to stand fast in the liberty that Christ has made us free, and we're not going to be entangled in the yoke of bondage. What is the yoke of bondage there? It's the law. Now I'm going to skip some verses, and I'm going to go to verse 13 now. I encourage you to read those verses, by the way, not right now, but when you get back and you're looking at these things. 
Verse 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Okay? That's, that's important when you look at giving. And it, Charlie taught this morning on, on Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you. When it says, let this mind be in you, he's talking about the mind of Christ, right? And you look at Christ, he took upon the form of a servant. Okay? So when we let that mind be in us in relationship to giving, what happens is we realize that we have liberty, and we say, wow, I've got liberty, I can do what I want. No, we've got liberty, and we've been given liberty for the purpose to do what? To love and serve one another. So when we come across issues that concern liberty, what we should do is say to ourselves, how can I make this decision in a manner that will love and serve those around me? That's the foundation of giving in the dispensation of grace. And you can see that. And you can see that very clearly. And let's just take a couple verses and look at them. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we get a baseline of contentment, and it scares me. It says in verse 8, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But if you go over to verse 17, it says, Charge them that are rich in this world. I would dare to say that if we look at God's standard of contentment in 1 Timothy 6, verse 8, and then he says, Charge them that are rich in verse 17, that we can raise our hands and say, I think this is going to be me. Okay? You and I live in a time and in an age where we've got lots of things. And we've got an overabundance of things to the point that they're, they're probably detrimental to us. But I want you to look at the attitude that happens here. It says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And that doesn't mean that they're supposed to do these things to gain eternal life. It means you've got eternal life. Lay hold on it. In modern uh, terminology, would be you ever heard somebody say, you need to own that, right? That's, that's laying hold of eternal life. Eternal life starts right now when we're saved. But did you see what the focus was? It says ready, ready, to, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. And he's talking to the rich. He's not telling them to open their mouth to communicate, right? And a lot of times when you see communicate in, in, in the Pauline epistles, what's it mean? It means giving. But do you see what the focus was there? That these folks, since they've got it, they need to be willing to give it. And they need to be, do, they need to be do, doing so in a, in a manner that is using their liberty to love and serve others. Now, you see this in... I wouldn't normally consider this as a uh, giving verse, but when you look at Ephesians chapter 4, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says, Let him that steals steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Does that fit our foundation for grace giving today? We're under liberty. I'm going to use my liberty to love and serve one another. It does. And if you think think about what happens here, here's a guy that used to take things from people, and now he's told to go to work, and he's told to go to work so that he can give it to others. You see what happens when you learn grace and you learn a lot about liberty? When you learn the gospel and you see what Christ freely did for you, And you look at a passage like Philippians chapter 2, which says, let this mind be in you. It all becomes about Christ. And when it all becomes about Christ, if we let Christ's mind be in us, he made himself a servant of others. So as we focus on Christ and we focus on what he does, 
and what we learn about in the Apostle Paul. I don't want you to think I'm telling you to go back to the Gospels. But when we focus on Christ and we go out and we serve each other, that's what we're here to do, right? We're supposed to be, when we're here and we're gathered together, I'm supposed to edify you, you're supposed to edify me. But what we do is we're doing it, we're using our liberty that we have to love and serve one another, and our finances should reflect that. That's what the Scriptures are telling us in these verses. Now, let's go look at just some basic principles. We've got about 15 minutes left, and let's look at some basic principles in verses that you've already heard. But go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9... <clears throat> Verse 6 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, but he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. I want to make a little side note about that in comparison to Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, when they didn't give enough, what happened? They were cursed. But when you look at what Paul says, when you don't give, what happens? You just don't reap. Isn't that what it says? Well, I'm not saying you give more and God's going to make you rich. It's, this isn't health and wealth. We're talking about out into eternity. But what I want you to see there is there what, he didn't say, you better do this or bad things are going to happen to you. He says you have a choice to use your liberty under grace to make an impact in eternity with your finances. How big of an impact do you want to make in eternity with your finances? It's a totally different perspective. And then he goes on, he says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. Do you know how much you should give? Because I don't. Why don't I know how much you should give? Because you're supposed to purpose in your heart. So back to the original question, how much should I tithe? Which is really, how much do I have to give before God gets me? Well, that's not the point. The point is, is you need to make a decision in your heart how much you want your finances to ring in eternity. Right? But it goes on here. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. If you teach tithing today, you make this verse null and void in your, people's, in, 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 in your congregation and your people's life. Right? How many of you ever gave cheerfully under a tithe program? Right? It's like, oh no, here comes that box of envelopes again. And, 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 then, and then you've got all the financial gurus. You turn on the radio, and, and they're very proud that they're Christian financial gurus, and, and you, need to, you need to tithe out of your gross. And they go through all this stuff, and you're like, where, where does this come from? And it, 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 it comes from misunderstanding of what the tithe is. But God loves a cheerful giver. And, and this is the illustration. Do, how many of you have hobbies? Okay. I have hobbies. Yeah. I have, ho- I, have, I have hobbies. I probably shouldn't have hobbies. But when you have hobbies, hobbies come with stuff. And there's really no better point in time in a hobby than when I get the new stuff, right? If you golf, oh, I got new clubs. What are you going to do? You're going to go out and get, oh, I got a new guitar. Oh, I got... It doesn't matter what it is. In my case, it might be shoes. But I, 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 got, I got these things. And, you know, when I went to the store, you know, you know what's different about to- uh, hobbies and grocery shopping? When you go grocery shopping, you got coupons, you're looking for sales, you're looking for all these things. When you go for a hobby, you walk in there with your wallet hanging out and say, just take it and give me what I need to make it better. And they do so. But you do so in a manner that you're very cheerful and you're excited about it. As soon as you get it, you go out and do it. Well, folks, that's how God wants us to give today in the dispensation of grace. Not because I'm making you give, but because of the fact that I can take my finances and watch it work somewhere. I can give it to somebody who's going to go preach the gospel in a place that I'd never be. I can take my money and buy Bibles and tracts and go and give it out to people. That's loving and serving one another more than anything else, isn't it? When we think about loving and serving one another, many times we think about, okay, here's a hamburger. I'm glad you're not hungry. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were. All right. What's the most loving thing that God did for us? How did he, what's the greatest expression of his love? 
Christ dying for our sins and, be, and, and, and rising from the dead, right? So, and I think I talked about this, I talk about this a lot, so you've heard this before, sorry. If that's the case, then the most loving thing we can do for others is show them God's love, and how do we show them God's love? By giving them the gospel. And if I get excited about those things and I see people coming to the Lord and I see people at places like this being edified and, and, and getting to the point where somebody says, you should tithe, and they say, no, I shouldn't. Not only is tithing taught wrong today, but the foundation of that's gone and I've got a new foundation and it's liberty and I'm going to use my money instead of for your building program, I'm going to use it to love and serve one another. And I can go out and I can point at that and guess what, I've got a new hobby now that cheerfully I can say, take it. And when I, when, I, when I do that, it's not just take it, okay, got my new hobby, whatever it is, and then you get back from the first time you use it, and you're like, ooh, this wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. The beauty about giving in grace is that when we give for loving and serving one another is that when we get to the end and we get to see what that produced, you're not going to be disappointed, guaranteed. Now, what does it mean to give cheer cheerfully? Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I can't think of a better passage. You know, I can tell you what it means to give cheerfully, and you know, you give a smile on your face. But when it talks about giving cheerfully, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, that they were willing of, them, that they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Now, just quick background here. Paul's trying to collect a gift for the poor saints that are at Jerusalem. He talked to the Corinthians about it, and, and he made reference to it in his first epistle. And, and now what he's doing is he's telling them to make good on this, and he's, he's showing them the examples. He's just saying, hey, look, you guys need to do what you said you were going to do, and he's giving them examples. And he gives them examples of the poor saints that are in Macedonia. Now, I don't know how poor they were, but it does say deep poverty, right? And if I look at what's, the, what's, what's, what's our standard for contentment? Food and clothing. I can maybe extract, extrapolate from putting some verses together that these people might not have had everything they need for basic necessities, right? They had deep poverty. And they have deep pover, poverty, but they want to help the poor saints that are, are at Jerusalem. They want to love and serve one another, and they do so in several different ways, but they want to do it so bad that Paul says here, in verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Why do you think they had to say to him, here, take this gift? Why do you think that? It seems to me that he probably thought that their poverty was a little too deep to match how much they were giving. But what did they do? They... It was with entreaty. They said, look, we want to love and serve somebody in our liberty in Christ. And even though we don't have as much means as other people, this is what we put together. And please take it. Can you find a better example of a cheerful giver there? Saying, look, let us participate in the ministry. And that's what we should do. And it's been said here before, and, 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 and I'll, I'll, I'll say it, and I've said it a hundred times. When we got saved, we didn't just get saved from our sins, but we got saved from a vain, worthless life Amen. to a life that we can have purpose in Christ Amen. and have liberty to help one another and not have to worry about the weak and beggarly elements and put us under bondage in the law. Now, the, the question always comes up, well, who should I give to and what should I give to? And the scriptures are, are very import, importantly tell us that we should give to people who are in need. And uh, there are people who are physically in need, but one of the greatest needs that we have today with people, if we're going to love and serve one another, and God commendeth his love toward us, is doing what? 
getting the gospel out, right? So if you want to give money, find a place that's out loving and serving one another in a manner that your finances can help. It also, we've talked about that him that is taught communicate. Okay, those, those folks who are edifying you, that, that's a good place. You can, you can help them. Sometimes they need the help. Sometimes they don't. They'll let you know. But what that does and what grace does for us that the law didn't do, the law, the Levites, were they were commanded to do what? Take the tithes. They were commanded to take the tithe. But what grace does, and I, I think this is true about, about anything you really apply it to under grace, is it allows us to correctly evaluate our motives without the, con the condemnation that comes from the law, right? Let me give you an example. These are exercises that I recommend you do, but I don't recommend you do. Have you ever wrote, written down what you do every minute of the day? From what time I did this to what time I did that. And you do that for a week, and then you do that for a month. And then you sit down, and you look at those things, and I did this much here, I did this much here, and I did this much here. I, you know what that does? That allows you to look at your life from a time standpoint and say, my priorities were here because I spent that much time here. And then my next priority was this, and my next priority was this, and my next priority was that. And then you can look at those things and you can say to yourself, okay, I don't like my main priority being this, so now I can consciously cut the time down on that and raise another priority, right? So the next month I can evaluate things a little different. And I can do so without being condemned. And what grace really does is it lets you live in liberty and love and serve one another and do things without having to worry about the law constantly condemning you so that you can really evaluate what you're doing. And that's a wonderful thing. And our finances should be the same way, right? We should be able to evaluate where our priorities are through our finances. Think about it this way. When you, you ever teach Romans chapter 5 to somebody and they say, so what you're saying is I can do anything I want and still be saved? And I always tell people when somebody says that, you've done your job because you've taught them correctly. And God, when he wrote the scriptures and when Paul penned them, and, and he wrote Romans chapter 6. He knew what, my, what when you teach Romans chapter 5, the first thing that's going to enter into somebody is by, oh, so I can sin that grace may abound? So then you look at that and you say, okay, can I sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So what it does is it tells me, okay, now, now, now I, can, I can organize my, my life in a manner where I set out to glorify Christ in my flesh. And the issue isn't, should we sin that grace may abound, but the issue is, is how am I going to order my life in light of this doctrine, right? Well, giving and grace is a lot the same way. When you teach it right, people say, well, I don't have to give anything? Yes, you're absolutely right. Is that God's design? No, it's not His design. His design is that you abound in His riches today, tomorrow, and so on. And that as you abound in those riches, that you can take the riches that you have in Christ. And I'm not talking about just money here. I'm just talking about all the riches that we have in Christ. And I can take those and in liberty love and serve one another. So in conclusion, what we did was we looked at when people ask you whether they should tithe or not, it's probably not really the real question. The second thing we did was we looked at tithing, and tithing is approximately how much? Let's say it's 23%, okay? And it essentially works as a tax. So if we look at things just from a basic standpoint, and you look at the Old Testament, you've got God, He has a nation, a land, a people, they have an identity, they have laws, those laws are facilitated by people, we see what those are. So the whole foundation based on Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5, and there's other verses you can do this, for tithing is the law. And that tells us the who, what, where, when, and whys. And we know that the who, what, when, where, and whys and hows, as taught today, are not the correct way to teach tithing. We know that the foundation is the law and we're dead to the law. We know that our new foundation is liberty, and that liberty tells us that we should love and serve one another in Christ. 
and we're given all kinds of examples. I didn't go through very many examples of giving in the scriptures today. Uh, you, you can study that out. What I wanted to do is kind of knock down one foundation and give you another foundation because with those foundations, it allows you to evaluate not just giving, but everything that you're going to do. You can evaluate from the standpoint, am I doing this with liberty to love and serve one another? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its clarity. We thank you that we, uh, we've been given clear instructions on how we need to do things. We especially thank you for the liberty that we have. I pray that we will use that liberty to love and serve one another. It's in your name. Amen.